Okay, so you've seen the title, you know why we're here. Now obviously, we absolutely adore Doctor Who, but that doesn't mean we can't talk about some of the things it maybe hasn't done so well over the years. And there are definitely some episodes that draw the ire of fans more than most. And one more thing before we begin, this video was written by the lovely Alex Carlton. And while some of my thoughts may differ to his, you can find the original article linked in the description. So with that in mind, I'm Ellie with Who Culture, here with the 10 most hated Doctor Who episodes. Number 10, Arachnids in the UK. Arachnids in the UK is not as bad as some make it out to be. We'll get to the controversial points in just a moment, but beneath those, the episode is semi-competent and had the potential to be among the best of series 11. That is, until it trips face first onto the concrete in the final 20 minutes. First, let's tackle Trump light. Robertson is a lazy and underdeveloped political allegory about as subtle as a grizzly bear at a birthday party, which allows the protagonist to take weak kudos winning shots at him throughout the episode. Trump is the easiest target for criticism currently walking the earth, and yet this episode feels so scared to rock the boat and somehow misses its planet-sized target. This episode also features the most oft-referenced example of 13's inconsistent and poorly thought-out moral code. At the end of the episode, Robertson mercy kills a spider with a bullet. Granted, he doesn't do this with an ounce of compassion, but the Doctor's response of, guns are bad, let's lure them into a suffocation chamber instead, is a a big oof. As is Ryan busting moves to Sheffield's sickest grime station as he uses Stormzy to Pied Piper the spiders to their agonising deaths. Congratulations, you pitted the Doctor against Trump and she somehow came off looking worse. Number 9, Nightmare in Silver. There's a lot of love about Neil Gaiman's sophomore story, but even the episode's keenest defenders can see that his original vision was significantly derailed. The end result is a script that struggles to cram in a busy plot, a major villain, and some heavy series arc plotting into a single episode. Without a doubt, this should have been a two-parter. Much of Nightmare in Silver's polarising reputation stems from the inclusion of Angie and Artie, the two children under Clara's charge as a nanny. These children are perhaps the true antagonists of the story, as they are irredeemably annoying throughout. This episode is also controversial due to Gaiman's reimagining of the Cybermen, which sees them dressed up like an Iron Man parody capable of patching out any and all faults in their design. Not only is this the biggest departure from the original vision of the monsters in the show's history, but the suspension of disbelief required to accept that the Cybers can install an app to make them immune to getting shot is a little much. Lastly, we'd be remiss not to mention what is possibly the Doctor's worst line of all time, which closes out the episode after Clara leaves the TARDIS. He says, Impossible girl, a mystery wrapped in an enigma squeezed into a skirt that's just a little bit too… tight. It's very icky to say the least. It doesn't even sound like something the Doctor would say. Remember how awkward he was when he was around River Song? To, to say something like that about Clara just doesn't seem right at all. A very strange inclusion indeed. Number 8, Hellbent. Hellbent had the unenviable job of wrapping up the trilogy, coming hot off the heels of the acclaimed Face the Raven and the undisputed powerhouse that is Heaven Sent. But unfortunately in the eyes of many, it really didn't stick the landing. After arriving on Gallifrey for the first time since saving it in the Day of the Doctor and the last time before Chibnall blew it up again, the Doctor uses Gallifreyan technology to extract Clara from her time stream at the moment of her narratively satisfying death. He then shoots and kills an incarnation of the General who had actually been an ally to the Doctor before referring to regeneration as being like man flu. It's no wonder this episode has tons of detractors. In the end, instead of returning Clara to the moment of her death, which would have saved the episode and given us a deeply emotional scene, Clara flies off with a shielder, a character who sold out the Doctor to the Time Lords. The Doctor allows this to happen at the expense of his memories of Clara, leaving him alone having just spent the last 4 billion years grieving for her. This is the worst trade deal in the history of trade deals, maybe ever. Hellbent is moff at his moffiest, taking what had the potential to be his magnum opus and moffing it all up by not allowing Clara to just die. Which is a real shame. Number 7, Let's Kill Hitler. As we all know, I'm a big fan of River Song and all of her episodes. Having said that, 
I can agree with some of the points made by the wonderful Alex here. So we'll start with a positive. This is probably one of the funniest episodes of New Who and is a genuinely enjoyable little romp of isolation. We're introduced to the character of Mel's, Amy and Rory's best friend in the whole wide world who knows all about the Doctor. However, she hasn't shown up at any point until just now, not even at their wedding. Now considering that they're meant to be nigh inseparable, it's a little hard to see the character as anything other than a late insert. Her identity is played as this huge mystery, but her sharing a name with the baby born last episode means that every single viewer knew exactly who she was before the episode's big twist reveal. The episode doesn't get better once River shows up. Let's Kill Hitler has an issue which only gets worse as time goes on, and that is the continued flanderization of River Song. In Silence in the Library, we see a smart, capable love interest for the Doctor, who has a bit of a flirty streak, but is also tough and serious when the moment calls for it. Sadly, at this point in the Moffat era, River had been almost entirely reduced to a walking innuendo. Now, I would have to strongly disagree with Alex here, and it's not just because I love the character, but I feel like the whole point of this episode is that we're seeing River Song right at the beginning of her journey. She's still under the influence of the silence, She's just following that programming that's been brainwashed into her. The smart and capable person that we see in Silence in the Library is the person she ultimately becomes because of all the experiences that she has with the Doctor throughout her life. Also, I just love River Song and I won't let anyone say anything bad about her even if they're right. Number 6. In the Forest of the Night there aren't many episodes on this list that are here purely because they're boring, but that's a testament to just how dull Series 8's In the Forest of the Night truly is. Honestly, I can't even remember what happened. Any episode that features a cast almost entirely comprised of children was going to be a risk, especially with the show's history of writing every child ever as rude and irritating. This episode does not bump that trend and the premise of the story is so incredibly boring that it drags the whole thing down even more. With all of London covered by a forest, 12, Clara and Danny must work to solve the case, facing down foes such as a poorly CGI tiger and that's it. Precious little happens here, and the episode doesn't even justify it with much character work, leaving the best scene on the cutting room floor. Nice one. I saw it all. Rise and fall, like the wave of a sea. Oh, and let us not forget the slightly problematic elephant in the room either. In the Forest of the Night features a child called Maeve who hears voices in her head and is on medication to help her cope with them. Upon hearing about this medication, Twelve is horrified and aggressively states that you people never learn and that when a child is talking, it should be listened to, sending a rather unwelcome message to children not to take their medication. Even worse, this stance is vindicated when it turns out that Maeve abandoning her meds and tuning into the voices in her head saves the day. It it doesn't take an expert to work out why this is a terrible message to send in a family show. Number 5. The End of Time and now we arrive at what will undoubtedly be the most controversial placement on this list. It's true this episode is adored by many, but it has its critics in equal measure. Yes, Ten's swan song is deeply emotional. Yes, Tennant puts in a career best performance. And yes, Bernard Cribbins was a truly wonderful man who has our bottom lip trembling every time he's on screen. But we're not here to talk about the strengths of the episode. And in fact, that's where the end of time's high points kind of end. Russell T Davis wanted to do something different with regeneration, and when it works, it bloody works. But with Ten's issues and vanity left unresolved at the end of the episode, the series was left hamstrung, with the next incarnation being villainized by his predecessor before he'd even appeared on screen. The end of time is coded like the end of the show, and does nothing to prepare audiences for the incoming change, at the point where, following the most popular Doctor of all time, they needed their hand held the most. Russell T Davis could have had his cake and eaten it too, showing a Doctor who doesn't want to change, but has to redeem himself in the end, like Twice Upon a Time. But instead, we're forced to sit through an RTD victory lap. There's also the stuff with the Vin Vocci, Joshua Naismith and the Immortality Gate, all of which feel like an afterthought. Even the much-hyped return of Rassilon boils down to a far too brief exchange between him and the Doctor before he's blasted back into the Abyss for the next five years. It's all oddly half-baked. And I do have to agree that a lot of fans hated Matt Smith's incarnation of the Doctor before he'd even uttered a single line, and much of that does come down to the attitude that Ten had towards his successor, and that's in the writing, and the performance, though it was great, definitely made out the 11th incarnation to be somebody who we shouldn't like. 
Number 4. The Saranga Conundrum To its credit, the Saranga Conundrum tries to do something interesting with its villain of the week by making the Pating a tiny adorable alien who wants to eat the ship not because he's evil but because he's hungry. A strong concept, executed very badly. The supporting cast in this episode is perhaps the weakest of the series, and neither of the B-plots are remotely entertaining. Firstly, we have the underdeveloped side plot involving a pilot with a heart condition, and secondly, we have Ryan and Graham performing midwife duty for a pregnant man. At this point, Ryan projects his insecurities regarding his own father walking out on him, and pressures a man who clearly isn't ready to be a father into keeping a baby he planned to put up for adoption. Ryan is played as the hero for this, for some strange reason. Another reason this episode is hated is because it spends the first half of its runtime pointlessly treading water. The Doctor wakes up in a hospital bed after being injured by a sonic mine and attempts to take control of a situation that is, at that point, under control. This results in an awkward and embarrassing climb down for the Doctor that makes her look incompetent and serves no purpose whatsoever. This never feeds into any story arc, it just damages 13 and takes authority away from the character. Personally, I think a lot can be said for how memorable an episode is, and the only part of this episode that sticks in my mind is the pating. Nothing else. Number 3. Love and Monsters Let's be honest, you knew it was coming. Once upon a time, Series 2's Love and Monsters might have taken the top spot here, but in recent years it slipped down the list slightly. Besides, plenty of fans are starting to come round to this strange little 45 minutes of telly. It's something of a relic, a product of its time. I definitely think that's true, I actually re-watched this episode quite recently and I enjoyed it a lot more than I was expecting to. It definitely is a product of its time, but in the best way possible. The first Doctor Light episode of New Who follows Elton Pope and his friends as they attempt to track down the Doctor with the help of Victor Kennedy, a character who might just hold the title of the worst villain in almost 60 years of Doctor Who. A mixture of juvenile writing, the casting of Peter Kay, and the decision to let a literal child design the Monster of the Week culminates in a monstrosity of a final act that derails what is otherwise a charming story about a group of wanderers finding purpose in each other. Nowadays though, all we can remember is Peter Kay waddling around in that disturbingly small loincloth. Number 2. Orphan 55 Orphan 55 is a front-runner for the worst Doctor Who story of all time, and that's thoroughly deserved. There is not a single element of this story that holds up to scrutiny, be it the ropey script, choppy editing, or the most god-awful supporting cast ever pulled together in the show. A thumb-sucking love interest, Jay from the Inbetweeners, whatever hyphen with a three is, and of course, Benny! 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 The episode then ends on the twist reveal that the dead planet on which the resort sits on is in fact Earth, and the Doctor warns that if humanity doesn't alter its planet pillaging course, then we're all doomed. On its own, this isn't an issue. Many Doctor Who episodes have political messages, but the problem is that the message is not woven into the story properly, and the speech that the Doctor gives is both extremely surface level and extremely patronising, feeling more like a slap on the wrist than a compelling argument. Aliens of London, in a jab against the Iraq war, gave us an early noughties UK government justifying a false flag war with unsubstantiated claims of weapons of mass destruction, and that whole political allegory is 10 times more subtle than Orphan 55, despite featuring giant green overweight flatulent aliens. Go figure. Number 1. The Timeless Children Surprise! <laughs> Only kidding, as if any other episode could hold a candle to the Timeless Children in terms of the sheer outrage it caused. Perhaps in an attempt to respond to comments that Series 11 was flat and uninteresting, Chibnall decided to make his mark and shake up the status quo in Series 12. Now, For the most part, this resulted in a much stronger series, with some decent intrigue to sink our teeth into. That was until the finale rolled round and the Timeless Children dropped the cannon bomb that sent Doctor Who fans into hysteria by revealing that William Hartnell was not the first Doctor. Ballsy move, but surely Chibnall must have known that this was not going to go down well. Sure enough, it didn't, and it proved to be a point of no return for many fans who turned against the show en masse. Perhaps because the fallout from this episode was so bad, it was barely touched on again, save from some unresolved babbling about the Doctor's time at Division. And honestly, we'd be surprised if it ever was touched on again. It'll just be one of those weird tidbits, like the Doctor being half human, that everyone just chooses to ignore. 
And that concludes our list. Now, like I said at the beginning, your opinions may differ to those included here, but please be respectful of each other's opinions. We're all entitled to them. We don't need to be nasty about it. Make sure you've hit that like and subscribe button and the notification bell as well. I've been Ellie with Who Culture, and in the words of River Song herself, goodbye, sweeties.